Dream Tower Media presents. Rogues of Mirth, the adventures of Darien and Blue. This episode, One Night in Mirth, by Robert Zoltan. A drunken monkey climbing on a rope. Clandestine loves in secret promise bound. A painted stranger, one woman's last hope. A pearl in midnight velvet to be found. The hunter's moon above dark tower shines down upon a play of vengeance and rebirth. A dozen nights in any other town hold far less than a single night in mirth. From the recollections and admonitions of Darian Vin. Chapter One The hunter's moon looked down on a desolate tower, perched at the edge of a bend in the Song River, that capricious waterway that ran through the eastern side of the city of Mirth and flowed on to the succulent sea. Atop the tower, a lone cloaked and cowled figure stared at the full autumn moon, but saw instead a pearl of great luster that had in recent memory dominated his mind and haunted his dreams. Verican Gell, the prematurely aging last scion of the House of Gell, then spared a glance for the stars with whom his father had engaged in many Gnostic conversations. But whatever astral secrets they had whispered before, they now glinted silent in the outer dark. Verican expected nothing more for he had long ago forsaken their language for darker vowels muttered to a different outer dark. Years ago, after his sister Lenara died, leaving him truly alone, he had sold the crumbling family estate on the outskirts of Mirth and purchased this shunned spire, once owned by a secret devotee of a now forgotten god. The man was said to have been a sorcerer who had communed with those of the outer dark and the abandoned tomes Verican had found in the study confirmed these tales. Strange rites and rituals written in an antiquated version of the language of Archaea, that already most ancient of lands in western Plamora. At the same time that Verican had abandoned hope in life, he had adopted these forbidden arts. Verican lifted the hatch to descend the stairs from the roof of the tower. The night wind rushed through, whistling down the staircase. With every step he could recall a wrong done to his family by the House of Kaliax, the family with whom the House of Gel had feuded for centuries. In the end, his family had lost all, even the unique priceless Gel Pearl, symbolizing the glory that was once the House of Gel. When he reached the top floor, he proceeded to the disheveled study and retrieved the dark leather-bound tome needed for tonight's ritual. Its weight seemed to drag him down with a final fatalistic conviction as he strode to the chamber at the heart of the tower. The walls of the hexagonal room were hung with heavy brocaded curtains that slowly swayed like an audience of drugged acolytes in the wind, blowing through the one large circular window facing west. Both the curtains and the worn rugs covering the floor were of dark green and black fabric woven with strange arabesques and characters. Two ornate lamps hung from the walls, and a grotesque antiquated black iron candelabra hung from the ceiling and swayed like a hypnotist's jewel. Ancient statues of unknown figures from Archaea, worn and weathered, stood in the shadows of the corners, 
six dying gods of Varrican's own private pantheon. In the center of the room, six small charms of copper, brass, and leather depicting strange melded animal forms manipulating arcane devices formed a mirror shape to the room itself. Each sat five feet apart and was connected by a copper wire run through greenish powder. The scent of sulfur lingered in the air. Varrican stepped over the wire, knelt, and opened the book to the page of a dangerous spell that would create a rift between the worlds, a crack through which those of the outer dark could enter in. They would alter him. Possibly the spell would destroy him, but it mattered little. He had stayed alive this long only to learn the strange skill to craft the six avatars, to grasp the diabolically complex configuration of words and gestures, to build up the strength to become a vessel able to withstand the invasion of body and soul by those of the outer dark, the six who shall not be named. It was worth living only long enough to act out this one last play of vengeance. Outside, the hunter's moon beamed down, The cool wind whistled between the buildings, down the stairwalks, and through the mazy alleyways of mirth. The Song River whispered and moaned on its way to the succulent sea. Then it seemed the stars blinked out for the merest moment of a moment, and a horrible cry ripped through the night's cloak of stillness, coming from the round window in the tower of Varrican Gel. The cry was cut off as if by a descending blade. The stars returned, quivering with an apprehensive silence. Chapter 2 A fortnight before the hunter's moon, daylight drew back like a theater curtain to reveal the prologue of a tragicomic opera in the city of Mirth. Between two three-story mansions on Silver Hand Lane, a tomcat beginning his evening prowl looked up to see a dark figure momentarily blocking out the constellation of the drunken monkey in the blue-black sky. Unimpressed, the cat moved on to his own much more important secret business. The dark silhouette was of a svelte man, suspended in the air and moving rather like the namesake of the constellation. But even a drunken monkey has more acrobatic skill than most sober men, and so it was with him. He slid along the nearly invisible rope to reach the cornice of the mansion and swung down to the ledge of a nearby window with deceptive ease. Then he opened the window and dropped inside onto thick ochre carpet, making no more noise than the single flap of a hummingbird's wings. A candle burning on a nightstand revealed a four-poster bed of varnished black cedar, and in the bed, lounging upon a crimson damask blanket, a beautiful young woman with perfectly coiffed black hair dressed in a golden embroidered silk robe. The man's vulpine face grinned at her as if she were a hen. She opened her scarlet lips, but before she could speak or act, his lean frame darted the few steps between them, leapt upon the bed, and pinned her arms to the mattress. He pressed his lips against hers with subtle violence. She moaned in protest, twisted her right arm free, and slapped him across the face with admirable force. Now, he whispered, holding his left cheek, upon which could be seen the thin line of an old scar. She gave him a humorless smile. You're late. I was delayed, my sweet. And drunk, she said, pursing her lips. Only mildly so, he replied, gesticulating, as if it could enhance his persuasive powers. I told you how I feel about drink, Darian Vin. She sat up and with surprising strength, grabbed him by his left arm and his shoulder-length dark hair and flipped him off the side of the bed. Darian rolled soundlessly and ended up in the position of a man meditating, facing her with an unruffled expression. Cora, my dear, I need a bit of extra courage to brave your father's house. He'd have my balls for breakfast if he knew I was here. Desire for me should overcome any apprehensions. He sprang up to a stance without the use of his hands, bowed, and then spread his arms and recited. The promise of gold might make me bold. The chance for fame might do the same. But for your kiss with death I'd dance, and parley for your underpants. Speaking of the promise of gold, started Cora. Darian's self-satisfied smile dropped faster than a sailor's trousers on shore leave. It pained him when his creative
creative expressions went unappreciated. Once, not so long ago, my dearest little demon, you hung upon my every floral phrase. My poetry moved you. Half-drunk limericks are hardly poetry. Darian's brow furrowed. Cora sighed. Don't look the wounded child. I do love your poetry. And me? Don't be silly. Yes, I still love you as well, my demon lover. She glanced toward her chamber door. And the fact that my father detests you makes you all the more desirable. But my love would soon wither living in a hovel. At least I'm out of left under. A room in the Copper District is barely a step up. It is all I can afford giving fencing lessons to young bravos. Darian walked over, sat near her upon the edge of the bed, and took her pale hands in his. But someday, dearest, my poetry will be recognized for its greatness. Be patient. No doubt, within a few years' time, I shall be appointed as a court poet. She snatched her hands away. A few years? Must I watch my face wrinkle like a dried apple while you await some improbable dream? Improbable? I thought you believed in my poetry. Was it not instrumental in winning your heart? I do. It was. But no matter how lovely they are, one cannot eat braised poems, or drink poems of fine vintage, or bathe in gold-trimmed marble poems, or live in a three-story poem with a rose garden in back. As for the position of a court poet, it opens only when the current poet dies or falls out of favor. And, when available, it may be in some distant land whose climate ill suits my delicate skin. If you wish to have me, now is your chance. Darian reached for her. She slapped his hand away. The window of opportunity closes. Several suitors desperately seek to win my heart, ones both rich and handsome. Most of these men my father approves of and so they repulse me. I am counting on you to extricate me from this uncomfortable predicament. Do not fail me, dearest Dare. She reached up and gave his ear a sharp tweak. He winced. But how can I climb through your window of opportunity? By two things with which you are already richly endowed. Darian looked confused. But how can my manhood win me riches? Cora snorted and rolled her eyes. <laughs> I was speaking of stealth and guile. Oh, I would have counted those as one. I do not pretend to have the scruples my father has in business matters. I care not how you gain wealth, as long as you do and are able to keep it. And stay free of legal entanglements. Darian frowned. When I left Damarand, I made a vow never to steal again. That was part of my life as an impoverished orphan. Cora gave him a dead stare. Your tale of woe becomes tiresome. You are naive, Darian. Every successful merchant and nobleman steals to gain his wealth and power. It is simply sanctioned by the local government, or they pay to cover up their misdeeds. If you wish to be a noble man instead of a nobleman, you will do so without me. Either break your silly, short-sighted promise to yourself, or break your promise to me to serve me all your days. Or did you forget that vow you made under the moon last summer? <sighs> I did not forget. Cora drew back and raised her brows. Do you regret it? Of course not. I love you, Cora Durvan. It is just- There is no just in love. Now, act soon, or I will forswear you, no matter how my loins ache. How soon? She paused and held him in her gaze. I give you, until the day after the night- of the hunter's moon to win my heart through gold, or silver, or jewels, or land, or priceless art, I care not which. I am a flexible woman. Darian nearly jumped off the bed as he rose. The night of the hunter's moon? That is less than a fortnight away. I can count days, Darian, and I will be counting them. But sweet angel of my soul, I need more time. You have until the end of the day after the night of the hunter's moon. Not an hour more. She held him in her gaze like a cobra holds its prey. Do this, and I will be yours, body and soul. But stab me in the heart, and I swear I will stab you back, Darian Vin. I will fabricate such a tale for my father 
that he will send every sharpened sword in mirth after your faithless heart. In truth, he would need little encouragement. Darian swallowed. Cora Durvan's face changed to a smile as easily as if she had slipped on a different nightgown. There. Now that unpleasantness is out of the way. Why are you still dressed? Darian's brain spun, trying to change gears from fight or flight to his mating instinct. He reached down to pull off a boot and tottered over the edge of the bed, his amazing dexterity cancelled out by his discomposure. And keep your groans to a minimum. I would hate to wake Daddy. He works so hard these days. What about those pernicious bed springs? He asked, rustling with his clothes as if he were undressing for the first time. I oiled them. She stood upon the bed, pulled her nightgown over her head with one swift movement, and tossed it aside. She smiled down, a naked goddess of mischief and destruction. Get on with it, Dare. We haven't got all night. Then she blew out the candle. <laughs> Darian Vin felt truly in the dark. Chapter 3 A fortnight later, mere hours before the night of the hunter's moon, a young man strode down the ramp of a cargo ship, up a dock, and onto a thriving, boisterous pier in the harbor of Mirth. Sailors swore and sang as they loaded and unloaded cargo. Merchants haggled, authorities rebuked and directed, and passengers embarked or arrived from long voyages fraught with tedium and peril. Even among the colorful visitors and lean, hardened sailors, the young man cut a unique and imposing figure. A full six and one-half feet tall, he stood, muscled like a panther, and walking with the same graceful power. His long hair was black, his eyes gray-blue, and his copper skin covered in strange blue-tattooed designs that marked him as one of the Indari, a tribal, semi-nomadic people that inhabited a land east of the Purple Mountains. Few were ever seen outside of Indar, even in Mirth, the largest and most diverse city in western Plamora. Many in Mirth considered the Indari no more than savages, but his shipmates, who had just returned from their cargo hall to Kulan, regarded the youth as far more. And the name Indari, for so they had called him since no Indari would give his name to anyone outside his tribe, would now mean something far different to them than savage. Now, the young man's work was done for a time. The season for cargo runs at an end. He wandered the pier, moving deeper into the labyrinthine city in a cautious manner, like a wild cat surveying new territory. He may have walked with a sense of composure and self-possession, but it made him no less lost. He had never been to any big city before Mirth, and since leaving Indar for reasons only he knew, he had spent most of his time on ships or working on the docks. Even his sleeping quarters had been on board a ship. He now had enough money to rent a room in the city for a month, and he finally spoke the common Amerin language well enough. But he felt at home no more than a wild beast would, without grass and dirt beneath his feet, without woods and animals about. No longer surrounded by rivers and lakes and hills, he was adrift like a ship in uncharted waters. The strange man-made sense of the city confounded him. The urban din was a perplexing cacophony. The sites were mysterious symbols that held unknown meaning. Everything felt strange. But as he walked down a cobbled alleyway leaving the pier, he heard a sound that was familiar and whose meaning seemed apparent. A woman screamed. The Andari ran in the direction of the sound. He stopped at an intersection and listened. He heard another cry, this time stifled suddenly. It came from the cobblestoned alley to his right. He sprinted between stone warehouses. The alley twisted to the right, opened into a small enclosed plaza, and then continued on the far left. In the plaza, three men had cornered a woman dressed in a violet cloak. Two held her by the wrists. The third, whose back was to the Indari, had his hand clamped over her mouth. The woman saw the Indari over the man's shoulder. Her eyes widened in appeal. Release her, said the Indari. All three men turned in his direction. The man in the middle started in surprise. Get lost, savage, said the man. The Indari strode forward. The man reached down to draw his sword from its scabbard. Before it was all the way out, the Indari had already whipped his long sword from its sheath. The man paused, then he spoke to his confederates. Leave her. The man dashed down the passage on the far left. 
His two comrades threw the woman to the cobbles and followed. The Andari's hand flashed to his hunting knife, but then he stopped, took a deep breath, exhaled, and sheathed his sword instead. He helped the woman up. She spoke some words he did not understand, and then stepped back, eyeing him with a mixture of gratitude and suspicion. He stared at her. The woman's pale face was painted with a blue mask around her eyes, and her lips were painted green. Her hair was also green, and ornamented with amber beads. She was the first woman in mirth that he had touched since arriving months before, and one of the most beautiful he had seen. After months in close quarters with sailors and on ships that reeked of rotten fish oil, her flowery feminine fragrance overpowered him. Why do you stare? She asked in the Amarin tongue, the most common language of Plamora. Her accent was strange. Forgive me. I've never seen a girl like you. She lifted her chin and brows. Girl? The correct term in your language is woman. Forgive me again, replied the Andari with a bow of his head. It is not my language. I'm still learning and spoke carelessly. Where are you from? Your face is painted blue, but your skin is almost as pale as snow. You are not an Indari. No. But your mention of snow calls forth a vision of my land. I am from the city of Lantandis, in the far north, in the region of Nobrigia. The Andari shook his head. I've never heard of such a place, but I know little of the world outside of Indar. I have not heard of your land either, but like you, I know little outside my homeland. Or at least I did, until the theft of the Eye of Thuria forced me into the wide world. The Eye of Thuria? What is that? The woman glanced around. May we leave this place? It is obviously not safe. Those rogues may return, or there may be others about. Do not worry. While you are with me, no harm will come to you. The woman looked him over for a moment, and then smiled. I believe you. Your face is that of a youth, but you are obviously a man. The Andari blushed. Come, we will find a safer place to talk. He took her by the hand, and led her down the alleyway by which her assailants had fled. They walked to an outdoor market near Merchant Circle, in the Copper District, and sat on a bench near a fountain in a square. I am Polaria, priestess to the moon goddess Sturia. What is your name? The Indari pursed his lips. We Indari do not give our names to those outside our tribe. The sailors call me Indari. You may call me that. Indari, I thank you for coming to my aid. She smiled and looked into his eyes. He nodded his head and again averted his gaze, pretending to stare at the passers-by. I do not believe our meeting was by chance. I believe that Thuria brought you to me. But I have no right to ask you for more than you have already done. What would you ask? The Andari looked at her ingenuously. I have journeyed from the other side of the world to recover something stolen from my temple. The Eye of Thuria. It is a relic of great power that blesses our people and our land. Thieves took it three moons ago, and since then Lantandis and her people suffer. A strange early frost has come to destroy our crops. A freezing wind unnaturally early for the season has frozen the river, and the red wolves boldly cross the ice into our city, dragging down people who dare venture out after the sun has fled. Many also suffer and die from a strange fever that seems to have no cause. These things never happened when the Eye of Thuria was in the hands of the effigy of our goddess in the main temple in Lantandis. Through divination by my elder sisters, we have tracked the Eye of Thuria to this city and to the house of Count Julian Kelliax, who must have bought the Eye if he did not order the theft. It sits in a room of his treasures on the top floor of his mansion. What appearance does the eye have? It is a pearl of unusual size and luster. No doubt to unbelievers it would be regarded for its great monetary value, but this means nothing to us. Have you sought audience with Count Kaliax? He ignores my requests. Can you appeal to the city elders? I do not believe they exist as such. 
There are politicians and noblemen that rule, and the chief among them would be Duke Lemarque. But my entreaties to his palace have also been ignored, although I come as an official representative of Lentandis. The Indari grunted. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I have found more honor among the sailors here than among those who make or enforce the laws. It seems laws affect those who can pay differently than those who cannot. This kind of deception is new to me. We have no money in Indar, nor have we need of it. Inda gives us what we need from the land. What can coins mean when one has the land, the lakes and rivers, and the bounty such things bring to any who would simply lift a hand to receive them? She gazed at him with admiration. Your way sounds like a noble one, and you, a noble man. But the final gambit I must risk is an ignoble one. I must attempt to steal the Eye of Turia back, though I am ill-equipped for such adventurism. Or I must pay someone who could win it back for my people, though we are not wealthy, and all I have is a small bag of gold Lantandis coins, worth perhaps 500 Mirth Soldans. The Andari raised his brows. That is no small sum. We would pay a hundred times that for the eye if we could. Polaria grasped his large, strong hands. As I said, I have no right to ask. Yet I also have nothing left to lose. I am desperate. Would you, noble Indari, dare and ignoble deed to help my people and save my land? Will you win back the eye of Thuria? Forgive my boldness. But I have little time to lose and nowhere else to turn. She stared at him with innocent pleading. He sighed and looked around. Apart from a few sailors, the citizens of Mirth had shown him little trust or respect. He had often been met with fear and prejudice. He looked into her eyes and was compelled by her plea, her loveliness, and truth to tell, by the monetary offer that was far more than he would earn on a month-long voyage. I have stolen nothing more than horses in Indar. But I have stealth, can climb, can fight. And you have courage. The Indari's mouth set in a hard line, and he was silent for a moment. I will do it. Polaria gasped. As tears welled up in her eyes, she closed them tightly and hugged his hands to her bosom. A single tear fell down across the blue painted mask around her left eye, flowed by the corner of her green painted lips and over her delicate jawline. It reminded the Indari of one of the many rivers flowing in Indar, but he knew that he was a long, long way from home. Chapter 4 The hunter's moon shot its spotlight upon Mirth, and the constellation of the archer aimed his bow at every illumined target. But the archer failed to spy the shadow of a man as it slipped over the eastern wall of the resplendent garden surrounding the house of Count Kaliax. The figure also eluded the guards as it dashed from tree to hedge and finally to the eastern wall of the mansion itself. Once there, Darian Vin pulled a second rope off his shoulder, swung its grappling hook, and threw it up at the second floor balcony rail. The hook caught with the merest of metallic clinks. He scrambled up like a monkey, this time sober. Peering over the edge, he saw no lights from the room and leapt over the rail onto the balcony to crouch at the double doors. He pulled a metal implement from his pouch, slid it in the crack between the doors, lifted up, and applied pressure downward on the handle of the right side door. He heard a sound like two coins clicking together. The handle turned. He pulled the door outward and slipped in like a night breeze, easing the door closed behind him. Darian navigated through the furniture of the room by touch and moonlight, he reached the inner door. After listening at the keyhole, he opened the door and peered out into a large, empty hallway. One lantern hung from the left wall. Several doors were closed on either side. A stairway rose to his left, and Darian crept up until he reached the top floor. He glanced around the corner. A dark figure loomed before him. He jerked back, and his hand flew to his rapier. Then he paused and looked out again. The marble statue of a soldier a few feet away had, of course, not moved. Darian pursed his lips and sighed in relief. 
Apart from the garden guards, the household was probably asleep, as would most be that were not poets, fools, or thieves at the third hour past midnight. He slunk down the hall, counting the doors on his left. He stopped at the third, a set of double doors, crouched by the keyhole and looked through. He saw a dim light. He drew a different implement from his pouch, this one a type of pick with a strangely shaped tip. He pushed it into the keyhole, moved it in and out and around several times while listening closely. Finally, he heard a satisfying click. Darian turned the knob, pushed open the door, and went in, shutting the door again behind him. He was standing in a large chamber that was lit by a pillar of moonlight descending from the center of the room high above. Lunar light also glinted through two tall windows in the far wall. Islands of shadowed objects filled the room, but the only one Darien could make out clearly, and the only one Darien had eyes for, formed the base of the pillar of moonlight. Darien caught his breath. Upon a waist-high wooden base under a glass case, resting on velvet black as night, shimmered a miniature moon, twin to the one in the sky above, a pearl of extraordinary size and luminescence. From where he stood, it appeared as wide as the length of his thumb. He stood and stared, moonstruck. The sight of it brought up powerful and conflicting emotions. When he was able to focus his mind again, the first thought that appeared was that it would be a shame to share such a treasure with anyone, even his dearest Cora Durvan. He immediately admonished himself for such a faithless, rapacious notion. He blinked, shook his head, and started forward. Then he froze as he heard a sound. It was a creaking noise, followed by a sharp, metallic snap. The window on the right slid upward. Darian skipped back behind a statue of a naked woman and peered out from behind her left buttock. A tall, muscular man climbed through the opening, slipped to the carpeted floor, and crouched in the shadows. Darian's brow furrowed. He had seen no place to hook a grapple to the top floor on that side of the house. Was the man a sorcerer? Had he flown up like a nightingale? The man paused only a moment before moving forward toward the center of the room. The pillar of moonlight revealed his form. He was no olive-skinned Amerin like Darien. His complexion was darker, like a Kulanese, but the parts of his muscular body that were not hidden by a sleeveless tunic and short trousers were covered in blue-painted designs. He's an Indari, thought Darien, and a tall one. What's an Indari doing in mirth? Never mind that, what's an Indari doing going after Cora's pearl? For it was clear now that the man's eyes were only for the pearl. Suddenly, the Andari stopped as if listening. Then he seemed to sniff the air like an animal. Darien's hand drifted to the handle of his rapier. The Andari narrowed his eyes directly at the poet swordsman. Darien ducked his head back. He couldn't have seen me, thought Darien. Darien peeked out from the other side of the statue. Still looking in Darien's direction, the Andari drew his long sword. Come out and face me, guard, said the Andari. Damn it, thought Darien. He drew his rapier, stepped out from behind the statue, and took a casual step forward. How in Plamora did you get up here? And how did you see me? I didn't. I thought I heard breathing. Then I caught your scent. Darien frowned. He sniffed under his arm. <laughs> I just bathed a week ago. I'm taking the Eye of Thuria back. The what? I feel no antagonism toward you. That's only because you don't know me. But I will cut you and your fellow guards down if you try to stop me from taking the pearl. I'm no guard. I'm a thief like you. I'm no thief. Right. You're just going to borrow the pearl, like a library book. It belongs in the Temple of Thuria. It belongs to the people of Lantandis. Darien's features scrunched up. The Temple of the People of what? The Andari's body stiffened and he went into a slight crouch. Darien stepped back and took the on-guard position, but the Andari's neck was craned up toward the skylight. Darien looked up. The pillar of light dimmed for a moment. Then a tremendous crash brought a shower of glass from above. A figure cloaked and cowled in black landed amid the rain of crystal and crouched like an animal. Its fingers ended in claws, though Darien could not tell if he were seeing gloves or some strange dark gnarled skin. 
Indari ran forward and raised his sword. The black thing shot through the air in a blur and struck with the speed of a cobra, backhanding the Indari before his sword finished its downward arc. The Indari's sword flew from his grasp, and he tumbled across the floor to crash into a wooden chest. Darian sprang forward, covering the distance in three leaps, and lunged at the thing's back with his rapier. It spun and batted the rapier aside at the last moment, and then lashed out with its other claw. Darian dodged and felt the wind of the blow as the claw tore out a few strands of his hair. He rolled over and sprang to his feet, dagger in hand. He drew his arm back to hurl. The thing crouched lower than a normal man could, with its knees almost over its head. Then it sprang upward like a frog and shot straight through the open skylight twenty feet above. Darian gaped. Then he cursed when he saw the broken, empty case. The pearl was gone. The Andari was back on his feet, with his long sword in hand. Friend of yours? What was it? No man, said Darian, glancing up at the skylight. The Andari jerked his head in the direction of the doors. Darian spun around just as the doors swung inward. Two guards burst into the room with swords bared. They stared in surprise at the scene. Darian stood in the spotlight of the moon. I know this looks bad, he said to the guards. But I didn't take it. The most you can charge me with is trespassing. Then he muttered to the Indari out of the corner of his mouth. How did you get up here? He received no answer and glanced to his side. The Indari was gone. He turned in time to see the Indari slipping out of the window. Left with only one opponent, the guards rushed forward. One of them shouted at Darian. Drop your weapon! But then I couldn't do this, replied Darian, lunging forward and thrusting one of the men through his thigh. The guard cried out and fell to the floor. The other lunged at Darian. Darian parried and brought his point to the man's neck without even breaking the skin. The man froze, wide-eyed. Drop it, said Darian. The man dropped his sword on the floor, face down. The man complied. Darian ran across the room, sheathed his rapier, and climbed out upon the window ledge. He looked down. The Indari was leaping from the side of the wall to a tree branch about eight feet away. You have got to be kidding me, said Darian. He examined the outer wall below. All he could see to use for climbing were small stone ornamental ledges, little more than lips, and carvings in the stone. I'd have had as much chance jumping through the skylight. Ah, the things we do for love. He climbed down quickly but carefully, finding what purchase he could. Finally, he came even with the tree branch the Andari had used. Darian had no leverage on the wall. The leap to the branch was too far. He decided that the Andari must be half tiger. He continued with painstaking care down the wall until he was ten feet from the ground. Then he leapt down and rolled. He came to his feet and scanned the grounds. He caught a glimpse of movement through the trees near the outer wall ahead. Then he heard shouts and the bark of a dog from around the corner of the building to his right. Darian sprinted forward through the garden and reached the wall just as the Andari was hoisting himself up. Darian knew he couldn't make that jump. He leapt up and grabbed onto the Andari's soft leather boot just before it was lifted out of reach. The Andari tried to kick Darian off, but Darian was too nimble. He climbed up the Andari's kicking leg, and when the Andari tried to strike him with his fist, Darian avoided the blow, grabbed the man's forearm, and swung from it like a tree branch to land upon the crest of the wall. The Andari exclaimed as he joined Darian at the top. You're like a damn squirrel! Darian laughed, his hand on his dagger handle. <laughs> More like a drunken monkey. Now, are we going to be friendly or get arrested? The Indari grunted and leapt down the other side of the wall. Darian went after. He remembered the Indari's uncanny senses in the gallery and felt that if anyone could track that cowled creature, the Indari could. Darian chased the Indari as he ran down a side street and up some stairs on the outside of a building. The Indari climbed up onto the banister, reached for the roof edge, and pulled himself up. Darian followed. When Darian reached the top of the flat roof, the Indari was gazing out across the moonlit rooftops toward the eastern side of Mirth. Why are you following me? asked the Indari, not even sparing Darian a glance. Because, my blue-painted friend, you're following it, and it has Korra's pearl. The Indari grunted and pointed. There, by that steeple. Darian squinted. He saw only amorphous shadows and silhouettes of buildings. The thing is dressed in black, 
How can you see it? That's the odd thing. It's unnaturally black. Darker than the surrounding darkness. A chill crept up Darian's spine as he squinted into the distance. Unnatural is the word. You're six and one half feet tall if you're an inch, and strong as an ox. Yet that thing swatted you like a fly. Did you see it jump through the ceiling? I'm not sure I want to catch it. Hey, wait for me! While Darian was talking, the Andari had sprinted off. Darian pursued. When the Andari reached the edge of the flat roof, he didn't slow, but actually increased his speed and hurtled the space between the buildings without breaking stride. Darian could only vaguely see how wide the gap was, and a surge of adrenaline shot through him as he followed his instincts and the Andari's lead. Darian leapt. His feet impacted the other side, and he continued on. The gap had only been about six feet, but that was far enough with nothing but moonlight to go on, as far as Darian was concerned. He was hoping they would take to the streets after that, but for whatever reason, the thing avoided being on the ground as much as possible. Darian supposed it was insecure about its looks. Not only did they not take to the streets, but apart from a few stairs, walkways, and a short foray down two alleys and an avenue, they were leaping across rooftops the entire way. Darian never realized that one could travel nearly halfway across Mirth and barely touch the ground, if you were desperate or crazy, that is. Darian was very nearly but not quite enjoying himself when he landed on a steepled roof and the clay tiles under his feet broke and gave way. He slipped, crashed on his side, and slid clattering down. Suddenly his feet felt only open air. He clawed out as his torso slid off the roof. His left hand clutched a gutter. It bent under his weight. He tried to pull up, but the metal bent further and made an unappealing creaking noise as if a precursor to something snapping or detaching. He stretched his foot out to the sheer plaster wall to stop his swinging. There was no window ledge or balcony within ten feet of him. He looked down. Although he could not discern the alleyway below, he knew he was at least three stories up. If he were lucky, he would only break his legs. Indari! Help! I've fallen! He reached up and, gently as he could, grasped the gutter with his right hand as well. It squeaked and descended another inch. Then he waited and held on. Interminable seconds ticked by. Darian pondered the strength and durability of metal gutters and fastening bolts. Ironically, his life hung by the integrity and quality of someone's workmanship. He knew the Andari wasn't coming back. The man would be glad to be rid of him. He wondered, if the positions were reversed, would he come back for the Andari? Considering their mutual opponent, he decided he might. He heard a sound from above. Don't move, said the Andari. The Andari reached down and grasped Darian's right wrist. The man's grip felt like a vice. Let go. Are you sure you can hold me? Let go. Darian complied. The Andari grunted as he hoisted Darian up. <coughs> Darian scrambled back onto the roof and flattened against the tiles. <sighs> Why? Why did you come back? The Andari shrugged. I don't know. Come on. I know where it went. He clambered up to the roof's peak. Hey, Blue, said Darian. The Andari stopped and turned back. Thanks. What did you call me? Blue. There's as much blue as there is you, with all those tattoos. I'm Darian. What's your name? The Andari snorted and shook his head. Blue. Then he climbed over the edge of the roof. Darian followed Blue across two more rooftops, these thankfully flat. Then they took a stairway down from the last roof to an inner courtyard. They exited under an archway, crossed a street, and descended a few more crumbling stone stairs to another avenue that ran onward to a bridge. Darian heard the rush of water and realized the Song River was just ahead. Stonewater Lane bordered the river on this side. On the other side of the river, two and three-story houses lined the shore. Further west, the river bent north to flow into the bay, and poised over that turning point was a crenellated tower that reached up like a black arm, extending its clawed fingers to grasp the hunter's moon. Blue pointed at the tower. It went there. Why am I not surprised? Chapter 5 Darian and Blue paused for a moment, as if spellbound. 
Suddenly, Darian felt as if he were lost in someone else's dream. He glanced at the once familiar city about him and knew it not. The Phantom Moon created a monotone, silver world where no separate objects existed, only angles and shapes of cryptic meaning. Depth, perspective, and size shifted like waves upon a sea. He gazed at infinite, half-transparent midnight worlds layered upon each other. But then, rising above it all, he saw the dark tower, solid and stark as a dagger, and a dim circle of light glowed in its side near the top, like the hunter's moon, like a pearl. Darian and Blue simultaneously started forward across the bridge without a word. Once across and past the buildings, they turned left onto the next street and walked until the houses ended in the exclamation point of the black tower. A few shallow steps led up to a large door of black oak. Blue tried the handle. Neither of them was surprised to find it unlocked. Whatever was inside had no fear of men, perhaps not even a thought for them. The entry hall had once, long ago, been welcoming. Now, one dim, hanging lamp revealed a table and candelabra, paintings and moth-eaten curtains, all covered with dust. The room exuded the musty smell of decayed memories. Violet light spilled down from a staircase leading upward on the right. Their swords whispered from their scabbards. Darian led the way up the wooden stairs. Drawn inexorably to the top of the tower, they ignored the closed doors on each floor, from which no light shone through keyhole or crack. They reached the top. A door to their right hung open. Darian glanced into a disheveled study in which an oil lamp sputtered. The room was uninhabited. He shook his head at Blue, though he sensed the Indari already knew. Light shone dimly from under the crack of the opposite door. Darian glanced at the Indari. On Blue's nod, Darian turned the knob and shoved the door open. Blue pounced into the room with his longsword raised, and Darian slid in beside him. The violet glow of two hanging lamps added their light to the hunter's moon that poured through a single large round window on the western wall, lighting in macabre detail a hexagonal room of outlandish appearance. Wind blew in from the open window, stirring the dark heavy curtains that were woven with symbols similar to those on the heavy carpet that covered the floor. A black iron candelabra, unlit, swayed overhead. Antique statues of eastern origin nestled in the corner shadows. An arcane arrangement of charms, wire, and green powder was in the center of the rugs. An unpleasant, charred scent lingered in the air, despite the incoming draft. But Darian's and Blue's attention was focused on the northern side of the room, where a large carved wooden chair, almost like a throne, was butted up against the wall. Upon it was the black cloaked and cowled figure, sitting not as a man would, but as an animal, feet hidden by folds of the cloak, but clearly resting upon the seat, the knees even with the cowled head. From that cowl, not a glimpse of color or light or reflection could be seen. Black clawed hands emerged from the wide sleeves of the robe that hid the rest of the form, though whether these were monstrous flesh or gloves, Darian was still not sure. The thing fondled like a baby chick, the huge pearl that Darian called Chorus Pearl and Blue called the Eye of Thuria. The thing paid them no heed. In fact, there was no sign that it was even aware of them. This possible advantage did not encourage Darian. As he did in most awkward situations, he spoke. I don't suppose there'd be any point in asking for it, he said to Blue. The Andari's lips were drawn back from his teeth. He growled and sidled toward the left of the figure, even as Darian subtly sidestepped toward the right. I uh, like what you've done with the place, said Darian to the thing. A bit morbid and decadent, but as a poet, I can appreciate that. A strong gust blew in through the window, stirring up the green powder on the rug and swirling it through the air. A short creak followed by a loud bang made Darian flinch and glance back. The door had been slammed shut by the wind. Darian! shouted Blue. Darian spun forward. The black thing was hurtling through the air toward him. He dove under it and rolled. Ah! He had not even regained his feet before the thing was upon him again. His full weight was upon his sword hand, and he could not bring his rapier up in time to block the thing's strike. His left hand closed over something, and he instinctively hurled it backhanded. 
one of the strange charms bounced off the thing's shoulder, and a small cloud of green powder dusted the front of its cowl and cloak. Darien caught a whiff of sulfur. The thing waved its hand, as if to ward off the dust. Darien shifted his weight to the left and thrust his rapier through the thing's chest. Ha! Instead of running clean through, his rapier pierced only a few inches deep. Darien felt as if he had stabbed a practice dummy of thick leather and wood instead of flesh and bone. The thing ignored the rapier and raised its right claw to strike. Darien pulled the rapier out as he jerked back, raising his left arm as a shield. Before the claw could descend, Blue's longsword flashed through the air and sunk into the arm. But even the Andari strike penetrated only an inch and then stuck. The thing whipped its arm back, yanking the longsword from Blue's grasp and flinging it across the room. Blue hurled himself upon the thing and they tumbled across the floor. Darien sprang back to his feet. Blue wrestled with the thing for a moment before it tossed him away. He crashed against the door. Just as he rose, the thing leapt upon him, grabbing him by the throat. He grasped the choking wrist with his left hand and smashed his fist into what should have been the thing's face. It had no effect. The thing lifted him off the floor with its right hand around his neck and struck with its left claws. Blue caught the striking hand by the wrist, holding it back only inches from his face. Darien was about to lunge forward and stab the thing with his rapier, but he stopped, knowing it would be ineffectual. Blue's face was turning from red to purple. Even the thick, muscled cords of his neck would not hold out much longer, and the thing's clawed hand was getting closer to Blue's face every second. Darien sheathed his rapier, ran, and leapt through the air feet first, kicking into the thing's back. It was like hitting a wall. Darien rebounded and tumbled back over the carpet, knocking his wind out with the impact. He had succeeded only in distracting the thing enough for Blue to gain a momentary breath. The thing proceeded to choke the life out of the Andari. <coughs> Darien fought to regain his breath as he struggled back to his feet. He scanned the room, wild-eyed and frantic for a possible weapon. Then he saw the greenish powder and remembered the thing's odd reaction. Darien bounded over, grabbed a handful, ran to the thing's side, and threw the powder into its cowl. The thing shook its head and fanned out with its left hand. Blue released that hand and punched the thing again in its face repeatedly. It dropped Blue to the floor for a moment, but retained its iron grip on the Andari's neck. The powder seemed to only annoy the thing, but with no more effective weapon, Darien ran back for another handful. He paused when he caught again the sulfurous scent. Then he turned, bounded to the wall, tore a lamp from its sconce, and ran at the thing. He raised the lamp and slammed it on what must have been the thing's very hard head. <laughs> Glass shattered and flaming oil splashed out. A flash momentarily blinded Darien. A whoosh of air exploded in green fire that enwreathed the thing's upper body. It hurled Blue aside. <coughs> then it jerked back and forth, waving its arms in a vain effort to escape the flames. Darien ran to Blue lying on the floor. The Indari's jerkin was alight, and Darien beat out the flame. <sighs> He helped the Indari back to his feet, and the two backed away toward the center of the room. The door and the nearby curtains that had also been dusted with powder were ablaze. The thing continued to wave its hands like a mindless puppet. The fire had spread onto the carpet in front of the door, and was inching its way across the room toward Darien and Blue. Suddenly, the thing turned and ran, and leapt like a flaming comet through the window. The entire doorway was now an inferno. Darien and Blue searched quickly, but found no other exits from the room. Then Darien's attention was drawn to the green powder on the rug. Blue! said Darien. The powder is explosive. You've got to get out of here now! The flames moved across the floor like an ocean wave toward the thick lines of greenish powder, 100 times the amount Darien had thrown on the thing. Darien estimated the fire would reach the powder in about 20 heartbeats. Blue ran and leapt onto the huge round window sill. He waved for Darien to follow. We must be a hundred feet up. Blue nodded, gave a grim smile, and stepped out the window. Darien ran and jumped up onto the sill. He looked down. A few seconds later, he thought he saw a splash of silver in the moonlit glimmering on the Song River far below. What if the water were shallow at this point? What if he missed and hit the bank? He glanced back into the room. The fire was a foot away from the powder and sweeping toward it. 
Suddenly, he noticed a glint near the magic circle that he now realized was not one of the charms. Darian's eyes bulged. It was the pearl. The flame was about to touch the green powder. An agonized cry burst from Darian's lips as he leapt out of the window. Ah! A flash burst for two seconds, as if the sun had accidentally risen too early. Then a tremendous boom resounded, and a clap of wind, like a gigantic hand, knocked Darian forward through the air. Ah! He fell. He saw first the moon, then the silver lines of buildings, then the glimmer of the river, then the tower of fire, then the river much closer. Or were those only rocks shining in the moonlight directly below him? He called out to Lady Luck in his mind, the closest thing to a prayer to the closest thing to a god that he believed in, wrapped his arms about his legs, tucked into a ball, and closed his eyes. He exhaled one last time and held his breath. A moment later, his back was slapped by the surface, and he plunged through cold water. He immediately let go of his legs. His left shoulder impacted the bottom of the river. Then he kicked upward and broke the surface. He swam to the far shore, crawled up on a rock, and looked up. Fire now licked at the outside of the tower. Black smoke was blotting out the hunter's moon. Suddenly, there was a tremendous boom, twice as loud as the first. Part of the tower exploded outward in greenish flame. Darian struggled up the bank, over a short stone wall, and onto the avenue. He looked back up as he heard a loud creaking of timbers and crackling of flame. The top part of the tower leaned forward like the broken mast of a ship and fell to the river below with a resounding crash. Something grasped Darian's left shoulder. Ah! He jerked away and sprang through the air. It was the Andari. Gods, Blue! Don't do that! Blue pointed at his throat and shook his head. Ah, too sore to speak? We'd better look at that. Blue pointed at Darian's left arm. Darian looked down and realized for the first time that his arm had been slashed. And that. Then Blue motioned toward the flaming wreckage and gave Darian a meaningful stare. Yes, we best not hang around. To my place. Blue nodded. As Darian and Blue fled down Stonewater Lane, the lights of lamps and candles winked on nearby. They turned left at Random Street and headed for Darian's room in the Copper District. Chapter 6 At dawn, the hunter's moon still shone, but as a faded ghost of a pearl in the pale silver sky, as if it had spent all of its power the previous night. Blue descended the stairs from a walkway that passed over the street of the gargoyles. Stone figures of various size, human, animal, and chimerical, lined the edge of the walk and crouched in the curve of the arch at the bottom, leering down at the violet-hooded figure that waited at the foot of the stairs. Few other eyes were around at this early hour. The figure turned and pulled the hood back when it noticed Blue. Polaria of Lantandis, priestess of Thuria, wore an anxious but hopeful look upon her pale, painted face. When Blue reached the bottom of the stairs, she embraced him. You have come. Blue stiffened a bit awkwardly, grunted, and nodded his head as she released him. Are you injured? She asked, noticing the bandages on his neck. <sighs> It is nothing, said Blue, his voice still a bit hoarse. She glanced up and down the street, then briefly up at the walkway before speaking in a more conspiratorial tone. What news? Dare I hope? He reached in a pouch and handed her a small object wrapped in cloth. She gasped and gaped at him. Then she quickly unwrapped the object. It was a plain, brown, naturally polished stone. Her brow furrowed. What is this? I almost died last night. I didn't get the pearl, but I thought you at least deserved a token of my efforts. I found it in the Song River after I dove off a burning tower from a hundred feet up. Her face fell farther than Blue had last night. You did not get the eye of Thuria? A voice spoke from above them. Oh, come now, Beline. You're an actress. Just pretend he did. The woman's head jerked up. Between two crouching stone gargoyles on the rail above, 
was another crouching figure that could have been a gargoyle, except that it was dressed in black cloak and cowl, and it moved in a way those other gargoyles, hopefully, never would, slipping off the wall to drop halfway down the steps above Blue and the woman. The figure threw back the cowl as it pranced down the stairs. Darian Vin smiled his fox's grin. If possible, the woman's face fell further and turned even paler. The whites of her eyes shone. Darian Vin? Then she glanced quickly at Blue and recovered her composure. You have mistaken me for another. I am Polaria, priestess of Thoria, far from Lantandis. Your accent's slipping, Beline, my dear, said Darian, reaching the foot of the stairs to lean casually against the wall. I'm disappointed. An actor should be prepared for anything on stage, and all of life is a stage. By the way, you do look most mysterious and enticing. I love the green hair. The woman glanced again at Blue. The Andari's narrowed eyes focused on her like those of a wolf watching a wounded deer. I swear, Indari, I do not know this man. <laughs> then how did you know my name? The woman ignored Darian and pleaded with Blue. I am Polaria of Lantandis from Nofrigia, Nobrigia, not this Belin. Blue remained silent. That's another thing, said Darian, waving a finger. You should have picked a real city, or made one up, not used fictional places from a theatrical drama, no matter how obscure the work. You never know how well-read your Mark may be, or, in this case, your Mark's friend. How are your three confederates, by the way, Nip, Port, and Brev? I'm assuming they played the roles of your three alleged attackers from whom the Andari saved you in that coincidental nick of time. Darian shook his head and pursed his lips. So desperate that you've resorted to duplicitous games? I am who I claim to be. I can prove it. Behold! She pointed toward the top of the stairs. Darian and Blue glanced up. They saw nothing but empty stairs with sky above. When they turned back, the woman was running under the walkway and down the street of the gargoyles. Blue turned with a snarl. <sighs> Let her go, said Darian, stepping down to pat Blue's arm. She's just trying to survive, like us. He sighed as he watched her receding figure. Sad times. The poor all trying to cheat each other out of what little they have. Of course, had her plan worked, she would have been poor no longer. And maybe I would have gotten paid. My friend, the coins she showed you were gold as much as she is a priestess of Thuria. Blue grunted and continued gazing in her direction until she disappeared down a side street. I trusted her. I almost died for her. <sighs> Join the club, my friend. So, you actually believed Lantandis and Nofrigia were real places? <laughs> A good-natured laugh escaped from Darian's mouth. Blue growled. I have not read many books, nor seen much of the world. I was a fool. Don't take it so hard. I'm realizing now that I was a fool as well, in a different way. Now, we have a problem, you and I. On the way here, I overheard two merchants conversing. Count Kaliax is dead murdered in his sleep. Blue glared at Darian. Yes, that thing must have killed him. Though the light was dim, the guards of Kaliax saw me. And though I am not yet famous as I would like to be, I could perhaps be identified. And they may have seen your tattoos. You may have just been a warrior with painted skin. It's not exactly rare, but the possibility of Indari might come up, and I doubt there are more than a dozen of you in the city, if that. What do you suggest? We have to leave Mirth, at least until things cool down. And I'll confess to you, I haven't seen much of the world either, only read about it. Darian glanced up at one of the grotesque stone faces grinning down at him. Maybe neither one of us is worldly enough for this city yet. Blue glanced around, as if sensing something unseen. My instincts tell me we should make haste. Agreed. We'll grab a few supplies, buy you a horse, and then be off. They strode briskly but with pretended nonchalance down the street of the gargoyles. A short time later... They were riding their horses at a quick walk toward the gold district. Mm. I hadn't planned on leaving Mirth so soon, said Darian. But I dare say, it will be interesting. We have all of Plamora to see, and more. More? What more can we see than the world? I have heard a mystic say that the walls between the worlds are thin. What does that mean? He glanced at Blue and smiled. I have a feeling we're going to find out. Why are we going northwest? This doesn't lead out of the city. 
One last thing to do before I go. Chapter 7 Cora Durvan woke late, ignoring the servant who brought her breakfast of spiced tea and lavender cakelets. She lingered in bed, vaguely remembering that there was something important about the day. But she drifted off to sleep again and dreamt that Darian Vin was climbing to her window and leaving a gift upon the sill. She woke with a start. That was it. It was the day after the night of the hunter's moon. Today was the final day Darian had to fulfill his promise of winning wealth, a worthy dowry for a woman of her exceptional beauty, breeding, and social standing. She tossed off the blanket, slid her legs over the side of the bed, and eased her dainty feet into her satin slippers. Then she went to the window and opened the drapes and shutters. Her eyes alighted upon a small object wrapped in crimson cloth and tied together with a note. Her breath caught. She snatched the small package from the sill. In her hand, it felt round and hard like a pearl. But if it were indeed such, it would be the largest pearl she had ever seen. Days before, Darian had hinted that his gift would be a pearl of great size and beauty. She assumed he had been talking in poetic metaphor, as he often did, to her annoyance. But perhaps, for once, he had been speaking the literal truth. She untied the string and gave the note a cursory glance to confirm that it was Darian's handwriting before tossing it away. Then she unwrapped the cloth. Inside was an ordinary brown stone, round and polished, like the kind she had seen along the banks of the Song River. She frowned, turning it over and over in her hand, as if to find something more. Finally, she snorted and set the pebble on the windowsill. Then she bent over and picked up Darian's note from the carpet. It read, My once, dearest Cora, knowing you, you'll read this after unwrapping my gift, and prove one final time that you prefer stones before heartfelt words. Tonight, I nearly lost my precious life to win for you a large, ignoble sum. It's far too high a price to win a wife, and far too low to stoop to pick a rotten plum. The gross result? My lover's limb has gone numb. I now prefer a kindly, simple girl. The gift I leave is what my heart's become. You never knew. My heart was the true pearl. Most sincerely, Darian Vin. The end. Rogues of Mirth, The Adventures of Darien and Blue, Book One, is available now on Amazon.com. One Night in Mirth, The Audiobook Adventure, was written, composed, and produced by Robert Zoltan. Starring the voice talent of Robert Zoltan, Corey Wilson, Danita Bayer, and Witten Frank. To hear more fantastic Rogues of Mirth adventures, go to dreamtowermedia.com slash podcast. To become a Dream Tower Media supporter, go to patreon.com slash literary wonder and adventure. One Night in Mirth was produced for Literary Wonder and Adventure Show. Copyright Dream Tower Media. 